Welcome to the Hermitcraft Recap! My name is Pixorifs, our writer is XP, and sometimes people pre-record things in advance. Such is the case with Bolt Symmetry, who seems to have been entrusted with the Nether Hub for the season, but that information hasn't yet featured in her own videos. We discovered it from all the people already donating materials to her designated chest array. Even more funny is that by the time her video covering it comes out, chances are she'll already be fully funded. I know Fall says she needs a few thousand of those blocks for her upcoming uh, Nether Hub project. I'm super excited about that. But the warp stems is what she needs the most of, and I probably have one of the best farms on the server for that, I think. Better hope she has some stretch goals planned. So, welcome to Hermitcraft Recap, we do time travel here, and with that out of the way, let's take a look at all the events and mishaps that occurred on the Hermitcraft server this week. Starting with False Symmetry, though her nether hub plans might already stem from the abundance of nether blocks to begin with, or from her being willing to gather up the new materials. As shown in False building a whole set of pagoda-style architecture to sell the warped and crimson fungi out of. The nylium that comes with it clashes quite a bit with the mycelium covering the area, but they now have a whole mayor to deal with that. It's not great on the mycelium though, I do actually have a plan on using the warped nylium, which is the uh, basically the grassy type of block that is cyan in colour. Uh, I'm trying to get used to the names of blocks, uh, so I'm assuming that you guys are too, I'm sure you guys know way more than me. Nylium and Mycelium battle it out more directly at XB Crafted's post-apocalyptic base, which becomes the battleground for a three-way conflict between Toxic Nylium, the forces of nature, and far future biotechnology. And it is also fighting to take back. I'm really digging this this area is looking freaking sick. <laughs> I think it's looking so good. The crying obsidian he's been farming from piglins is put into use as a toxin barrier, which in the lore of his base stops the fungus from spreading by generating harmless mycelium to block it. It does nothing to contain Corallis, who sees XB setting up a sewer pipe and asks if he can move in. I'm kind of used to living in sewers. Do, am I going to have to feed you pizza? Teenage Mutant <laughs> Ninja Corallis. <laughs> He's not the only one looking to relocate. Vintage Beef puts the final touches to the living room at his beachfront villa and goes in search of an island to live out his own vision of a dystopian future. Settling on a distant tiger island, he strips it of all the spruce wood and starts laying out the foundations for a cyberpunk-inspired cityscape, building with the blackstone and neon wood colours afforded to him by the nether update. He needs shaders and darkness for the full effect, but the first building would make a cozy hideout for any street samurai. Yeah, I didn't expect it to look this good right away. Once we get more buildings, it'll obviously look a little bit more... Ah, you gotta be kidding me! So Wells Knight is back from doing taxes. That is not a joke, that is literally the explanation he gave. We procrastinated and put off our taxes until like the last possible minute. And doing taxes when you're self-employed is super, super involved. Fresh out of his adulting hiatus, he is unfortunately greeted by a total loss of gear, including, mind you, a beacon he was carrying. Oh, look at you. You're looking all dapper and stuff. How you doing? I'm doing... wells. To cheer him up, amongst other reasons, XP Crafted, Vintage Beef, iGevin, and Joe Hills join him for a friendly game of archery at Cubfan's Pyramid. The idea of this one comes down to filling in your score meter as fast as possible by scoring as many bullseyes as you can in a row. Oh, okay, yeah. good job, Wells. Well, thank you. GG, well done. <laughs> Wells done. Basically, it's Cub's way of trying out what the new target blocks are like, and it turns out they're cool enough to base a game around. I mean, it's no mini golf, but it's pretty solid. Apparently, there's already a company named Target. Some some small company that, you know, you might have heard of, but... All right, ladies and gentlemen, check it out. We got our big sign up. Target, a shot above the rest. We're intentionally putting the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable to, yeah, avoid being associated with the, uh, <laughs> the department store target. Another nifty contraption Cub throws together has a much more practical application. It's a water flushing system for everyone's favorite carpet-based newspaper. And as a savant of mechanizations, Cub can't help but cash in his ZF voucher for renaming a contraption in his Cave of Wonders, since it comes with a free tour of the place. Celestial Cosmodrome. Yeah, the Celestial, Celestial Cosmodrome. Cosmodrome. I was a little bit worried that someone was going to come in here and be like, ZF smells um, wardrobe, or, you know, something really mean and insulting. <laughs> Just in time for ZF to introduce a whole new circuit into the bunch. 
It's the final part of the Enchantomatic rig, and it's ultimately what matters most in life the experiences. Having ravaged the Minecraft wiki for info, Zed decides to get his furnace connected to a bamboo farm for fuel and a cactus farm for smeltables. Thus, earning ourselves all of the stored juicy XP inside. His more smashing ideas are in the meantime appropriated by Azuma Void. With the knockback to armor stand behavior explored by ZF before, Azuma puts together a minigame for the gaming district. The goal is to eliminate the opposing team by knocking your armor stand onto the same blocks as them, plus you can utilize extra tricks in the special action cards you might get randomly. So it's kind of like, sorry, in a way. Oh, oh, oh I hit both. You move both. But I am that, technically touching. They are, but this one's out, and that was a complete surprise because if I use knockback one, I think it's going to go past yours. I think it might. It you might just even leveled hit both. the playing field unintentionally. <laughs> there is much progress on the armor stand accessories as well, as Azuma improves the head exchanging facility at the Cowmercial area. His own trading power in the market of mini block heads is ensured by an improved wandering trader farm that piles the merchants together away in unloaded chunks so you can come back and trade with several at once. We've got two wandering traders, but we've got way more llamas than that. Huh. So while people are building minigames in the district Tango specifically decorated for it, Tango Tech himself is building a massive one right under the Cowmercial area. It being a mushroom biome sure helps since he wants to experiment with darkness levels. We are about to make a deck building, dungeon crawling, treasure hunting, collect them all trading game. The plan is to build an enormous dungeon through which the players will have to make their way while avoiding two ravagers trapped in the labyrinth with them. Their experiences can be enhanced with special booster cards that can be found at the end of the dungeon. These can be unlocked by dousing out soul flames scattered across the dungeon's many rooms. The goal is to score bragging points by collecting sets of special renamed items much as they did in the Hermitron game back in Season 4. And that's not even getting into the treasure hunting mechanic powered by manually hidden lodestones, which you're supposed to discover by finding secret compasses. And this is entirely too much for us to just talk you through, seeing as how it took Tango himself two full videos to explain. Just watch his own videos on it, and we'll hope it'll be more self-explanatory when people start actually playing it. It's gotta be different every time they go in. It can't just be like, oh, I go to the treasure room and I get the same loot I get every time. That's boring, right? For another fun brain twister, check out Corallis buying an enchanted book from XB Crafted and not the other way around. The man specifically got rich from the enchanted books he has been trading, and so much so that Corallis starts a whole bank to keep both the money and the librarian villagers in. Though XB Crafted introduces him to a whole new way of bartering and shows off his whole piglin gold exchange and the rest of his personal base. iJevin returns to the series with more base progress than ever as he brings his seabound discus of end brick incredibly close to the vision showcased in previous videos. To his credit, he gets quite a few distinct curves out of a game made entirely of cubes. Uh, then, once we kind of have a final shape and everything is sort of connected together, we are going to start working on putting different things inside the base. And that's when kind of um, the pathways and all the portioning will come into play. So that goes along the lines of maybe we don't need so much Prison Marine, maybe adding some different blocks in. The same could be said of the rolling landscape surrounding Joe Hills's winery, which gets expanded towards B-Dub's base if only to cover up the unfinished edges. He still has work to do at other people's bases, but he's not entirely sure which corners of the server are still covered in canines, so he converts the former dog catcher voting booth into a kiosk where people can remind him not who let the dogs out, but where. Next problem, anybody now has a direct line to me, the dog catcher. And if you need help spotting Joe while he's out and about, he's the one wearing the off-brand netherite armor. This is not a perfect kit, but you know what? I managed to take something that was really rough, losing all my stuff in lava, and use it as an opportunity to replace everything. And I feel like I'm going to be better for it now. If you wanted something very on-brand, Rendog delivers it immediately as we see a flashback to an oddly familiar hippie van docking at a space station diner. But before Ren Bob can have his full prequel movie, Ren takes us netherite mining using not just TNT, but TNT minecarts, which means there's even more heavy metal involved. After installing item transport upgrades at the Big Logs Badlands and announcing the sale of wart blocks and shroom lights in the shopping district, Ren builds the long-promised Jawa Sandcrawler at his base, for the second time because the first recording got corrupted. He also begins terraforming the nearby landscape for his next monolithic mega-build, Darth Vader's castle from the planet Mustafar. Now who has the high ground? 
Having discovered that the biome he started his gold farm in might not be suitable for it after all, Grian moves to a more picturesque neck of the nether, one with a few promising landmarks which just makes him put extra effort into the overall look of it. Look at this! The nether is completely different! Instead of a humble gold farm, we get a humble gold farm surrounded in an upside down centre section of Grian's Wonder Mansion covering it up, hanging from the nether ceiling over a lava ocean. There may or may not be plans for more farms and more expansive builds in the area coming in the near future. Potentially I chose not the best location to entice people, but I'm thinking I can I can invite some people over here, see if they want to form like a nether colony over here, something like that. I think that would be cool. On the somewhat literal flip side, we find TFC, who begins renovating the temporary shack at his base into something more concrete. White concrete, to be precise, with a stone brick floor. And while he plans to dig around the edges of the four chunk area he's marked out, the plan is still to build a tower all the way to build height and fill it with various and sundry farms. I'm probably going to end up digging out uh, the surrounding hills here so that there is a gap between the tower and the surrounding surface area. He'll have company up there, considering B-Dubs' terraformed cliff is already halfway to build height, and now it has the makings of a castle on it. Despite the render distance fog making it look a little hazy from ground level, the cathedral-like facade takes shape and looks impressive as ever up close. And that's what matters to me, although it is a lot more blocks to collect. I could do this whole thing out of stone, but I think this looks pretty cool. B-Dubs also puts his building skills to work on Impulse SV's beacon shop, which you may recall he negotiated to rebuild sometime last week. Playing on the fact that beacons are a very pretty light source, the business expands into a lighting shop which just happens to still sell superpower lamps for a diamond block apiece. Impulse is bemused by this change at first, but is much encouraged by how much space B-Dubs has left in the roof for a redstone powered light show. And the need to restock the store with end rods and other useful light sources means he has an excuse to work on not one, not two, but three farms, including a new blaze farm design, a chorus flower farm, and a separate chorus fruit farm for all the purple popcorn you could want. So I think it is time for our first harvest, and this should be fun. Oh, that is a beautiful sight. Yeah, maybe you're causing a little bit of lag. Oh, that is so cool. It almost looks like fireworks going off. Sadly for Escal 85, there isn't an easy way to farm a literal million leaves, which is about how many he needs to decorate the branches of his mega tree. That's an that's that's an that's a ridiculous amount of leaves. After a little testing to calculate exactly how much tree farming he'd need to do by himself, Iskel is distracted by the arrival of a treasure map left by Mumbo. His player marker doesn't appear on the map at first, but a few clues lead him to a barrel in which Mumbo has gifted him 64 gold and a pretty sweet dunk. Iskal responds with a sick burn of his own. Since your gold farm is so great, here is golden present of doom. P.S. Pull lever. <laughs> Which ultimately gives him the idea to have other people collect a million leaves for him, and he sets up a redstone contraption at the shopping district to gamify the collection of leaves and eventually award a grand prize. And finally there's Mumbo, who does pretty well with his interface set to Yaha Fiddly D mode, and on the return of 12 Bambar from Iskal, immediately sends it off to be made into a suit. So he, I mean, he did complete the challenge, you know, he gave me the 12 bamboo, which is incredibly valuable, and I do now have my suit back, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> How do I look, dude? <laughs> I'll do a little spin, do a little twist. <laughs> That's not even the weirdest transformation he's responsible for this week, as he decides to give his base wants and desires. Effectively turning it into a Tamagotchi, the temple will demand the sacrifice of eight different items to appease it. Sadly, none of those items is Grian, but he is still slain multiple times on the temple steps at his own request. Cool. Again? <laughs> is this what I'm going to be doing for the rest of the day? Again? More? More? Oh, more. Well, that was incredibly satisfying. And that's about it for this week's recap. Our writer is Loy XP, and my name is Pixorifs. In this week's end screen theatre, behold the power of this fully operational battle state, I mean, fully automatic basalt generator built by Zloy for his Truly Bedrock series. Don't forget to leave a like while you're still here and subscribe so you won't miss future recaps. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.